Hi. I keep uh, having to return here because I have a sense of Christian duty that keeps compelling me to speak about these things that God has shared with me. And uh, that's a good thing for all of us, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that finally Mark Cahill has begun to understand that uh, he has a responsibility uh, to bear upon his shoulders for leadership of the Catholic Church in the world. And uh, it's about time that I started to, uh, you know, exit my 40 years of wandering in the desert and, and come into the promised land. And I still have, you know, work to do in terms of my own personal holiness, but I'm committed to uh, the person and message of Jesus Christ who's behind me on the cross, always looking over my shoulder and helping me. So uh, this concept that I need to discuss with you is uh, the concept of, it's related to the concept of divine providence, which is more than just a concept, but it's an actual truth. You know, it's the way that God ordered and designed the universe uh, to work everything together, uh, you know, towards his purpose. St. Paul expresses this idea that all things work together for those, for good, for those who love God. And I love God. Uh, so I have confidence that, you know, all things will work together, uh, not only for myself, but for everybody. But included in that is this, uh, you know, idea in an in individual life, we have to, you know, first come to terms with who we are in God's sight and God's eyes. And uh, in that process of coming to terms with that, we have to, you know, accept or deny that uh, calling in our life and, and to say yes to him or no, just as Mary said yes to him but she had the opportunity to say no, although I don't think she would have said no, given all of the grace that had been poured into her life. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that, you know, I have heard people talk about this concept, um, and it's related to faith in the Eucharist and, and the access that we have to graces. Uh, so let me start with that. Uh, this is uh, something which, in part, has I have, it's been aided or St. Therese, the little flower, has aided me in understanding this because she contemplated and talked about in her uh, spiritual autobiography, A Story of a Soul, she said, you know, why is it that it seems that some people have been given greater graces than others? Because God loves everybody equally and we all share equal dignity uh, and are equal in the eyes of God in that way. However, there are some flowers that are more beautiful than others, and there are some uh, people who have, you know, more graces than others. And, I mean, this is clearly reflected in, in the gospel as well, that Jesus tells the story of the men who were given different, you know, measures of talents. And, you know, it, it's spelled out very clearly. Some have ten, some have five, some have two, some have one. Um, and, you know, St. Paul confirms this as well in sacred scripture when he talks about, you know, the the variety and diversity of gifts, but also the fact that some people are given certain gifts and other people are not given those same gifts within the body of Christ. And they're all meant to be used together in harmony and shared with one another. But, you know, first and foremost, as an individual, we have to come to terms with uh, what gifts that, you know, the Lord God himself has given to us. And then uh, we need to take responsibility for the, uh, you know, diligent and, uh, the diligent and sincere, you know, authentic use and, and implementation and, and practice of those, you know, with those gifts to build up the body of Christ. But it is also true that, you know, in my own personal life, when I have come to an awareness of who it is God is calling me to be and the role he's calling me to play in his church, I have to be very conscious and aware of the fact that, you know, for me personally, uh, my eternal destiny relies upon my uh, carrying out and fulfilling this task and to do, duty and you know I have a responsibility just as every single person has a responsibility to uh, use each and every one of those gifts that God has given to me in service to the church and so if I have been given great gifts it is a fact of that that they, a huge and large burden has been imposed on me as well to use those gifts responsibly. If I waste and squander them, it is me, myself, and I who will have to answer to the Lord Jesus Christ on my final judgment, you know, as to why I withheld those gifts or, or didn't use them diligently and apply them, you know, with, with fervor. And it requires me to become a saint. And uh, it's a sobering thought. 
and perhaps I can ask for the prayers of, of people out there to, man, help remind me of that because I, I, in this moment, know that I'm falling short of that. But uh, the truth of the matter is that my own personal sanctification depends on the exercising of the gifts which God has given to me in the same way that every single person out there who's listening to this, their own personal sanctification, you know, depends on their responding to God's grace in their life, which includes the gifts that he's given to them. This is the way that we cooperate with God in our own, you know, the sanctification process. This is the uh, beautiful harmony between you know, faith and, and, and works. God has prepared the good works in advance that we will complete and do, and he's given us the grace to complete them, but we ourselves must uh, exercise the use of our free will in a responsible manner in order to uh, ensure that, that we are using these gifts properly. And this is clear Catholic Church teaching. I don't see why anyone would dispute it. I think the problem that many people have had in terms of their relationship with me is finding it difficult to believe that the things that I'm telling them about the gifts that God has given me and the calling he's placed on my life, they have difficulty believing that he would give uh, that responsibility and those gifts to a person like myself. What, whatever that means, you know, however people look at me or view me, I don't really know for sure, but uh, I don't really care in the respect that, like Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, I believe it is, he says that, uh, you know, it doesn't make a difference to me whether I be judged by human authorities or tribunals, I don't even judge myself, Paul says. He says, I leave that up to God, you know, and, and he's concerned about completing the work and doing the task that has been assigned to him. And his conviction about that is based on, you know, this this manifestation of God's divine presence in his life in a powerful and unmistakable way. And uh, that's something, as I have reflected on in my life, you know, for the last 17 years, since I first became very powerfully aware of God's presence in my life, you know, that uh, I, I've tried to been making sense of what all that means, right? And, and like in my life, what that has caused has caused a great deal of vicissitude and a great deal of uh, erratic behavior on my part and rash and hasty decisions, which have led me down roads and paths that are very destructive to myself spiritually, but also to the other people who I've come in contact with and drawn into into my life of, of avoidance of my Christian duty. And so, uh, you know, uh, lately, as I have, have uh, been trying to become more obedient to the Lord, one of the things he's revealed to me through Pope Benedict's book, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, from the baptism in the Jordan to the Transfiguration, was uh, is on page 313 of the book that I have... <laughs> You know, he just spoke very clearly to me when he said that, you know, Mark reports that uh, the apostles were scared when they became conscious and aware that uh, God dwelled within Jesus Christ, this man who they were uh, in intimate contact and relationship with. And at various points when they uh, became soberly aware of the fact that God, that Jesus Christ himself was God, uh, at first, in the case of St. Peter, made him uh, recognize and experience the wretchedness of his human existence, you know, and his unworthiness in the sight of God. And he even asked Jesus to depart from him because he couldn't bear the uh, scrutiny of such a divine manifestation. And, and one of the things that it, you can see in the life of Peter, too, it caused erratic behavior because we have the life of a man who was a Galilean fisherman, right? And then all of a sudden, the Son of God, the second person of the divine trinity, comes and says, uh, you know, cast your nets on the other side of the boat. I know you guys have been out fishing all night, you know, and, and, and Peter acknowledges, Lord, if you say so, we will, but we've been fishing and we haven't caught anything. And, and then when they catch this overwhelming abundance of fish, that's when Peter realizes this is not just some ordinary man. This is, this is God. And it scares him, right? And he uh, alternately goes between the firm and solid recognition of Jesus Christ as the Messiah and the uh, lack of recognition of what the Messiahship actually means. You know, within the space of uh, two paragraphs in the Bible, we see this when, when Peter makes his profession of faith in Caesarea Philippi that, you know, yes, you, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then in the next, uh, you know, paragraph, he says, uh, but I'm not going to let you go to Jerusalem and die. Uh, and Jesus tells him, you are, become, you are acting first 
as an agent of the Holy Spirit is not flesh and bone that give you. Now you're acting as an agent of Satan, you know, and all of this within the personhood of one man, Peter. But, and I have also come to understand this in reflecting upon my own life and, and being able to identify with, with St. Peter, which, you know, <laughs> one of the two pillars of faith who, you know, I, I feel increasingly closer to as time moves on is that, uh, he uh, experienced the uh, vicissitudes of this recognition of the divinity of Jesus and, and also his own calling from the Lord. Um, it was a preparation for, for when Jesus died and was crucified and you know went back to the Father in heaven and left the keys to the kingdom of, of heaven, you know, the leadership of the church in the hands of the apostles but in specifically in the hands of Peter. So all of these uh, vicissitudes and, and these instabilities were uh, leading up to, you know, Jesus training Peter up to take over for when Jesus himself returned to the Father. So, see, G Peter was rock, but he had to become rock solid through the process of, uh, you know, his falling away from God and recognizing God's mercy and, and coming to trust more deeply in the person of Jesus Christ himself. And so I have recognized this this uh, same dynamic taking place within me, you know, throughout the course of the last 17 years. And and I'm sure that it's been going on my whole life, you know, but uh, I have more of a conscious remembrance of, of you know, the way that the workings of God's grace in my life uh, since I was 23 and I started coming back to Mass and you know, God began teaching me and, and pouring and infusing knowledge into me from above that uh, was apparent <laughs> that no one else in my uh, peer group was uh, experiencing, you know. And, I mean, I didn't have a peer group. My peer group was the Pope and the saints who kept coming and visiting me spiritually and teaching me things from above, you know. And, and I remember for a long time, one of the ways that I ran away from my calling was to complain to God about like, why does it seem like I can't, you know, maintain any human friendships or relationships, you know, and I uh, came to the point where I discovered in the monastery uh, back in 2007 that the Lord was like, listen, I have been giving you friends in heaven to be your constant companions and guides, and you're spending your time complaining that, uh, you don't have human friends. Well, these friends are much better and more powerful than any friends you have and can give you better companionship and comfort. Uh, and that was part of the problem. It wasn't about comfort. It was about, you know, like, let's get the mission done. And so, uh, you know, it was kind of like an epiphany. Duh. Don't complain about it, Mark. <laughs>